Okay, good morning, um, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. I think we've got our tech sorted out now. Um, my name is Edward Simpson, and I'm the director of the South Asia Inst Institute at SOAS. Uh, I'm your host um, for this afternoon's event. Welcome to the third Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Memorial Lecture, um, which is run in partnership with the Bangladesh High Commission and 7th of March Foundation. It's the third time we're running this lecture. The first was given by Professor James Maynard and the second by Dr. Sahela Nazneen. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to have to introduce uh, Professor Raman Soban, who I will come to later. It's a, for us, it's a prestigious and important occasion because it celebrates our partnership, not only with communities in London, but with South Asia more generally. We like to think of ourselves as an open-minded and open-armed institution. And it's events like this that to me symbolize um, the modern spirit of, of SOAS. So before I introduce our lecturer, uh, I would very briefly introduce my partners and co-sponsors of the lecture. First is Her Excellency, the High Commissioner of Bangladesh, Syed Namuna Tasneem, amongst whom many achievements and accolades and distinctions is that she's an alumna of SOAS, uh, which I like to recount. Uh, she will give introductory remarks and will be followed by um, my colleague, Nuruddin Ahmed, from the 7th of March Foundation. Uh, then I will speak again, I will introduce the speaker, and then we will move to the lecture, the part of the afternoon and evening you'll hear. But first, to the High Commissioner, Your Excellency. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Jen? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, to assalamu alaikum to Professor Iman Subhan from Dhaka and all my fellow expatriate British Bangladeshis. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, what a pleasure and what an honor to be uh, partnering this event, at the Bangabundu Centenary Talk, uh, titled The Role and Vision of Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in the Making of Bangladesh Nation State with such a prestigious institute, uh, uh, university such as, uh, you know, educational institute in the UK, such as SUAS which of course was, uh, you know, I'm a SUAS alumna and I did do my master's here. So it's a great, great pleasure. And, um, uh, uh, you know, with, again, such a prestigious institute from the Bengali British community here, which is sustaining the honor of the 7th March speech. It's called the 7 March Foundation, probably the only 7 March Foundation in the world. So uh, I am truly honored to be uh, co-hosting this or you know, partnering this event today uh, with Professor Edward Simpson, and of course, the South Asia Institute uh, and the good work done on Bangladesh and the Bangabundu, the founder of Bangladesh. Um, I think that in its own right, SOAS is the only university in the United Kingdom that has um, Bengali language and literature course, both in undergrad and graduate studies. And I want to pay a special thanks to my friend, Professor William Radici, who I understand, I, I worked with him in my previous tenure here in London, and he was so passionate about establishing this, uh, this creating these courses. So, uh, so as in its own right, uh, doing research and courses on Bengali language and literature uh, does stand out to be organizing this particular talk on the father of the nation of Bangladesh. Um, today, as we speak from yesterday, 17th of March, the next 10 days, Bangladesh government would be celebrating three very special, two very special occasions uh, that is sort of monumental and it only comes every 50 years, 100 years. One is, of course, the birth centenary of the father of the nation, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, that started from 17th of March 2020, but will continue until December 2021 because of COVID, uh, we couldn't really do the celebration. So it is again resuming from this 17th of March. And of course, this is the golden jubilee of our independence. And as we speak, South Asian leaders for at least six South Asian, five, six South Asian countries are all going to be in Dhaka, including prime ministers of India, president of Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bhutan, Nepal. Everybody's going to come and express solidarity with the people of Bangladesh, the government of Bangladesh, and the 1971 war of Bangladesh, because they all recognized us. 
So I, on this very special occasion, organizing uh, today's talk, I think it's we are extremely fortunate that I'm the High Commissioner here, and I can part, you know, be a part of this. And we all are very fortunate. This is a very special moment. And of course, the third special moment is this year is also Bangladesh and United Kingdom's 70, uh, 50 years of diplomatic relations that started from February. It will end coming February, which will be uh, uh, also organizing very befittingly. But uh, today's particular talk on our father of the nation on this occasion, I pay my homage and uh, respects to the greatest Bengali of all time. And of course, uh, the undisputed leader of Bangladesh independence, uh, the father of Bengali nationalism, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I do want to uh, thank SUAS for giving us an opportunity to partner it, partnering it with them. I want to thank Seven March Foundation because Bangabundu had always had a very special relationship with Britain, but more importantly, he had a very important and special relationship with the British Bengali community here, who has never failed Bangabundu. They are there, they have always been Bangabundu's foot soldiers. Uh, whatever Bangabundu wanted them to do to support his cause of creating an independent Bangladesh, they've always been there. And one such institution is the Seven March Foundation. They not only represent those progressive values that Bangabundu believed in, the progressive values that Bangladesh nation state is based on, uh, democracy, secularism, Bengali nationalism, and socialism, they are also actively promoting the pro-liberation values. They are opposing the anti-liberation values of Bangladesh. And we know that Bangladesh nation state was created and there was a dichotomy. There was these two groups of uh, school of thoughts where someone believed that Bangladesh should emerge, that is led by Bangabundu. Everyone believed Bangladesh should be a secular state. It was not the group which thought that, you know, it should be an Islamic state, even if it was uh, to be becoming, uh, going into self rule or independence. So, particularly in that context, I want to congratulate and thank the Seven March Foundation to keep the flame, you know, uh, uh, burning. They never fail to do this uh, talk on every 7 March. And they have given due honor to the 7 March speech. I do hope that on the centenary year, uh, the 7 March Foundation and the SOAS actually takes Bangabundu's values and familiarizes Bangabundu into many, many other institutions in the UK, in the mainstream and all that. Uh, coming back to Bangabundu, uh, let me just say that, you know, in, in, uh, and I did say it the other day as well. Uh, but before that, I must say two words about Professor Eman Suwan. What a great honor it is to have Professor Eman Suwan uh, in the, today's talk. Uh, when uh, Bangladesh High Commission London also organized the last talk at the London School of Economics uh, with Professor Amartya Shen, at that time, the only person that we could think of that can discuss, be a, uh, you know, be a co-panelist with Professor Amartya Shen and qualify to do so, it's our most eminent uh, national asset, an economist, uh, Bengali nationalist activist, and also a valiant freedom fighter, Professor Rehman Subhan, who was Bangabandhu's rather confidant uh, even before the uh, independence, because you know there was this turbulent time, which I have heard is the month of March of 1971, from beginning of March until the 25th. There was, because the 1970 elections gave Bangabundu the mandate. So practically a shadow government was running in Bangladesh and that, that, that in, in there, in that aspect, he was a close confident advisor to the father of the nation. And we, he was of course also working in the post-independence planning commission. So from every aspect, uh, you know, today's uh, talk uh, the, uh, given by Professor Iman Subhan would be such an honor to be uh, hosting by Bangladesh High Commission along with SOAS and Samad Foundation, but also we will learn so much uh, from what he has to say about Bangabundu. I uh, uh, do want to uh, mention that, you know, the other day, Professor Iman Subhan in his talk uh, discuss as a discussant, he did mention about one thing that, you know, he mentioned that uh, Bangabundu was, you know, he realized that how wrongly the Pakistan government was using the issue of religion uh, to, sub to justify all the wrongs that were being doing uh, against the East Pakistani uh, uh, state, uh, sorry, the uh, Bengalis in East Pakistan. And uh, this is exactly the very value that Bangabundu upheld when he founded Bangladesh. He made sure that religion is never used. And Professor Rehman Subhan in his last talk also mentioned that Pranusa Sheikh Hasina, Bangabundhu's visionary daughter, she also absolutely values this. And she always mentions, he, he, there's a quote unquote for him, and I don't have it in front of me, but I, I was listening to his talk the other day. And he did mention, Professor Iman Subhan, that also his daughter, Pranusa Sheikh Hasina, also is determined not to allow religion 
into politics, not to allow religion as a tool to, uh, you know, to brainwash people or to create Bangladesh or transform it into an extremist country. So it's extremely important that the values on which Bangabundhu created uh, Bangladesh was stems from that uh, particular uh, you know, uh, conversation that was taking place in the 60s and 70s before the, uh, before the founding of Bangladesh. And lastly, I would say one thing that you know, after uh, when Bangabundhu founded Bangladesh as a diplomat of Bangladesh, we had studied this in the Foreign Service Academy that there were, you know, he was under pressure from many um, important Muslim countries that we will recognize you. Why didn't you, uh, instead of you, why did you create the People's Republic of Bangladesh? Why don't you create, continue with the sustained Islamic Republic of Bangladesh? But Bangabundhu had the guts and the courage to say no to them flatly on their face. They said, would you name your country so-and-so? If you cannot do it, I am not going to convert my country to Islamic Republic. It will continue to be a people's republic because we have suffered under an autocratic, military, authoritarian Islamic Republic. So uh, very rightly, Bangabundhu took his lessons, uh, like Professor Eman Subhan has said. And I just want to say that this 10 days in Dhaka has a theme. It's called the Eternal Mujib. Yesterday, this 10 days overarching theme is Eternal Mujib, Mujib Chiranton. And today's uh, uh, particular to every day will have a different theme. Today's theme is Mahakale Torjuni. That means on 7 March, the finger eternal, the, the finger and the speech that motivated the Bengali nation to take up arms, to go for an armed struggle to liberate Bangladesh. So it is so befitting that we are organizing this here. And I would like to uh, conclude by a quote by Cyril Dunn, who's a British journalist, just to say, what kind of a Bengali was Bangabandhu? that in 2004, when BBC did this survey, why was he chosen as the greatest Bengali of all time? And I already mentioned in the other speech at LSE that this was not a title that we gave to Bangabandhu or Bangladesh government gave or Sheikh Hasina government gave or somebody else gave. It's the BBC's listener survey. Uh, just like, you know, Friend of Bengal was not chosen by people or government of Bangladesh, it was chosen before Bangladesh was born in 1969 by the people. So all these titles that he gets from the people and the honor, why? So this, this quote, I think, is the best quote about Bangabundu and his Bengali and his uncompromising attitude, uncompromising principle, unequivocally, he has always rejected anybody. His first concern was the Bengali people's welfare, Bengali people's rights, civil, political, cultural. And from that aspect, I think this is a very good quote to hear, to, to, to say here today, to conclude. So journalist Silindan said, in the thousand year history of Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujib is the only leader who has, in terms of blood, race, language, culture, and birth, been a full-blooded Bengali. His physical stature was immense. His voice was redolent of thunder. His charisma worked magic on people. The courage and charm that flowed from him made him a unique superman in these times. And he's talking about 1970s. So I'll, I'll end here. We look forward to listening to Professor Iman Subhan. And uh, we will also, from Bangladesh High Commission, we record it. We will be uh, uh, giving it on our website. And we are truly honored to be having him give this talk and partnering this with the SOAS South Asia Institute and the 7 March Foundation. Gratitude from Bangladesh High Commission. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Many thank you for such a sharp and engaging introduction to our talk, to our um, program. Next, we'll move on to Nordin Ahmed from the 7th of March Foundation before we move to the lecture itself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edward, distinguished chair, uh, Your Excellency, Bangladesh High Commissioner for Bangladesh, uh, Sayyida Muna Tazneen, and the most honorable guest today, it is really ple good pleasure, honor, both honor and pleasure to be able to say a few words today. This is a significant lecture for us for a number of reasons. First of all, we, we are really pleased to be back with the third lecture. Uh, actually, the third lecture was going to be last year, uh, but it was canceled due to COVID. Uh, we had we had a re grand plan for this year, but due to once again COVID restrictions, we we had to give up all these ideas about having an exhibition, cultural function. 
just part, just put up with this uh, rather modest virtual lecture. Uh, but what, what is most pleasing that we are able to start from this, this lecture where we left. Last year we were going to uh, have the lecture where the um, chief guest was going to be Professor Rahman Suban because it was Bongobandur 100th birth anniversary. And we thought Professor Rahman is, Suban is the most fitting speaker for that lecture. But nonetheless, we are able to continue with him. And this year, it is also important because this is golden uh, jubilee of Bangladesh independence, hundreds Art anniversary of Bongobondo, uh, Bongobondo. So therefore, everything makes is important. This lecture, uh, well, also because I must say that we do hear quite a lot about Bongobondo, dreams of Bongobondo, vision of Bongobondo. Sometimes lay people find quite distinct, difficult to distinguish between reality and what is reality and what is myth of Bangabandhu because we cannot, we are not in the position of asking Bangabandhu what is his uh, what vision was about Bangladesh. So therefore, nearest we can go is Dr. Professor Rahman Suban is the best person to tell us about Bangabandhu dream about Bangabandhu role in making of Bangladesh, but equally importantly, the people that was with him shaping Bangladesh, making of Bangladesh. So therefore, I think we are very uh, lucky to have Dr. Uh, Professor Subhan with us, because Professor Subhan and or, what, what, one of those people who I worked very closely with Bangabandhu in the very uh, difficult, challenging situation. R Professor Suban had ch choice when he returned to Bangladesh that he could have chosen a career and settled in West Pakistan, capital of Bangladesh, uh, then Pakistan. But instead he chose to stay and serve his country and stay in the provincial capital and work under Bangabandhu's leadership. So therefore, we are really grateful Professor Suban is able to uh, give this lecture. And I think I'll stop here and pass on to uh, you, Edward, to take over. Thank you. No, thank you very much. So two very warm and welcoming introductions from co-sponsors of this event. Um, it now falls to me to introduce uh, Professor Shoban, but in the interest of time, I'm going to cut short a little what I was going to say. Um, in his many years, he has done many things. I think that is fair to say, um, including 20 years as an economist working at the University of Dhaka. He was a member of the Bangladesh Planning Commission served in the early 90s on the Council for the President of Bangladesh and has played numerous instrumental roles in policy and government initiatives in Bangladesh and beyond. And as many of you know, he's currently chairman of the Center for Policy Dialogue, an organization that he founded in 1993. And he's published very widely on enterprise, financial institutions and governance, but really, and I suppose cutting very short what I was going to say, we're so pleased and, and um, honored to have him here this evening because he's been at the heart of the action, so to speak, for a very long time. And I think that it's being at the heart of such action that he will be able to reflect uh, this afternoon in the lecture on the role and vision of Bangabandhu, Sheikh Mujib Rahman in the making of the Bangladesh nation state. So with a very warm welcome from the SOAS South Asia Institute, colleagues at the High Commission and the 7th of March Foundation, Professor Chauvin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you. High Commissioner, Director Simpson, Director Mr. Nuruddin Ahmed of the 7th of March Foundation, and all who may have signed on to this enterprise today. Uh, it is a great privilege for me to be invited to give this lecture in remembering Bongobondu, uh, particularly since this is his centenary year and it is also coinciding with the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh. Uh, 50 years ago, I was uh, a young man actively involved in the liberation struggle. And I remember returning to Dhaka at the end of a nine month camp. Can everyone hear it or is it just me? I'm afraid it's probably everyone. I think so. I thought it was just me. Um, so Neil, could you try and recall um, Professor Soban? We appear to have lost his connection. Sorry about this, everybody. As you can see, we have encountered a Zoom difficulty. I hope Professor Simpson is taking initiative to make a phone call to Professor Iman Suwan's uh, private secretary. I'm trying my best. Give me a moment, sorry. Shall sh Sorry about that. Uh, we had a power cut over here, so we faced some of the practical problems of the Zoom economy. However, uh, let us uh, get on with it. Uh, can you hear me all right now? Absolutely. We can hear you. Welcome back, sir. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so as I said, it was it's a great privilege for me to be invited to give this memorial lecture uh, on this historic occasion. I feel it a great honor. Uh, the presentation I'm making is the role and vision of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman in the making of the Bangladesh nation state. Now, new nation states traditionally emerge out of a prolonged historical process, both where both political circumstances and a variety of heroic figures play a critical role. In my presentation today, I argue that while a number of important figures left their footprints on the journey to Bangladesh, 
it fell to Bangabandhu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, to emerge at the right time in the right place to play the role of torchbearer, who finally led the Bengali people to the promised land. In this defining historical role, he drew upon those various forces which served to make up a nation and worked them together to make up the intricate and durable fabric of a nation state, which would withstand the most savage assaults to tear it asunder. Such a heroic task demanded, demanded great political skill, an impeccable sense of timing, a capacity for inspirational leadership, and a people who were made ready to move forward with Bangabandhu to take the historical process to its conclusion. When we attempt to deconstruct the actions of a leader in giving direction to the historical process, it is no less important to also understand the thought processes of such a leader in giving direction to the struggle. In the case of Bangabandhu, we will observe that his own deeply held values influenced his actions. But no less important, his actions and experience also shaped his values. Bangabandhu's awareness of the need to forge a sense of identity within the people he wished to meld into a nation, his exposure to the vicious forces of communalism, which were ruthlessly deployed to undermine his people's sense of identity. The importance of democratic mobilization on a mass scale to sustain the struggle against the military oppression and the need for broadening his vision to include not just the quest for a nation state, but to also construct a just society shaped his vision. When Bangladesh eventually emerged as an independent state, Pongabandhu ensured that his vision, derived both from belief, belief and experience, would be incorporated into the founding principles of the nation state. Nationalism, secularism, democracy, and socialism eventually served as the four pillars upon which the Bangladesh state was to be constructed and were eventually inscribed in our constitution. My presentation is structured around four themes. The construction of national identity, democratizing the struggle, the emergence of the Bangladesh nation state, and a vision for Bangladesh. Uh, let us begin by talking about the construction of a national identity. Bangladesh emerged out of the Pakistan state, born in 1947, to provide a homeland for the Muslims of the Indian subcontinent within the state of Pakistan. The people of Bangladesh found themselves entrapped in a peculiar dilemma. They had become part of, a Pakis of Pakistan by proclaiming their Muslim identity. But at the time of the partition of India in 1947, 22% of the population of Bangladesh were Hindus who expected to enjoy all the rights associated with the shared Pakistani nationality available to the majority Muslim population. Thus having acceded to a Pakistan state defined by its religious identity, the political co coherence of the Bangladesh polity demanded that it recreate itself as a secular state where religious identity was no longer acceptable as the sole basis for national identity. The, this point was well recognized by Muhammad Ali Jinnah in his famous inaugural speech before Pakistan's national parliament, proclaiming Pakistan's secular character and defining religion as a personal affair, having nothing to do with the affairs of state. However, the issue of the position of religious minorities in Pakistan applied largely to Bangladesh. West Pakistan had solved its own problems, its own dilemma of having a large a uh, Hindu in population by cleansing itself of its own religious minorities. Once Pakistan came into existence, Bangladesh's religious identity could never again 
provide the basis of its nationalism. This was consistent with the logic of the Lahore Resolution, which sought regional autonomy for the Northwest and Eastern provinces of India, and not religious autonomy for the Muslims of India. Since the fight for Pakistan was built around the demand for autonomy of the two Muslim majority states of Northwest and Eastern India, this demand for regional autonomy remained the central driving force of Bangladesh's politics throughout its tenure in the Pakistan state. Within a united Pakistan, right from the first days of its new nationhood, the Bengalis found that their commitment to regional self-rule as demanded in the Lahore Resolution had been subordinated by the central government of Pakistan. Had this central government been a democratic government where the demographic majority of the Bengalis within the Pakistan state would be reflected in the shared exercise of political power at the center, the lack of promised provincial autonomy for Bangladesh may have proved more politically tolerable. The denial of autonomy for Bangladesh in practice meant the exercise of central power by a non-Bengali dominated ruling elite drawn from the ruling classes of Pakistan, allied with the military and bureaucratic elite where Bengalis were virtually excluded. This denial of shared power of this, at the center for the Bengalis, as well as the frustration of their demand for provincial autonomy was compounded by the assault on the cultural identity of the Bengalis associated with the proclamation by Pakistan's first governor general, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, of Urdu as the single national language of Pakistan. Urdu was a language of certain provinces of India, where it was spoken by both the Muslim and Brahmin elite. Urdu was in fact the mother tongue of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, derived from his birth in Allahabad. Whilst Muhammad Ali Jinnah could barely speak Urdu, and could neither read nor write the language. This quite fallacious association of Urdu with the Pakistani identity recreated a sense of Bengali identity for the inhabitants of Bangladesh, which they felt had been subordinated to their Muslim identity. Political domination and cultural subordination of the Bengalis was compounded by the denial of democratic access to the economic opportunities being created by the Pakistan state. In the 1950s and 60s, the state played a critical role in providing the dynamic of development in most recently independent countries, including Pakistan. A West Pakistani dominated central government used its monopoly of power to channel resources and to manipulate economic policies which served to accelerate the development of West Pakistan at the expense of Bangladesh. Thus, for example, national import policy was used to channel Bangladesh's export earnings from jute, the country's principal source of foreign exchange receipts, to finance the industrialization of West Pakistan. In return, Bangladesh was to serve as a protected market for manufacturing exports from West Pakistan. Within Bangladesh itself, the exercise of administrative power was monopolized by non-Bengali bureaucrats and deployed to promote the growth of a non-Bengali business elite who over the next 24 years came to dominate the modern economic sector of Bangladesh. This denial of political rights and economic opportunities to the Bengalis of Bangladesh inspired the demand for democracy and self-rule for Bangladesh, which constituted the central driving force of Pakistan's politics for the 24 years of its existence as a unified state. To sustain this denial of democratic rights to the Bengalis, demanded a projection of a Pakistani identity over a Bengali identity. It was argued that an economically and politically strong West Pakistan ruled by an enlightened elite should be tolerated by Bengalis in the name of Pakistani nationhood. 
to mask the subversion of the spirit of the Lahore resolution, the Pakistani ruling elite had to revive the notion of Pakistan's religious identity. It was argued by this elite virtually from the first year of Pakistan's existence that the assertion of a Bengali identity was un-Islamic as well as anti-Pakistani. The reality of Pakistan's politics was that its rulers have always been driven by secular appetites for power and wealth, where religion is provided a convenient smokescreen behind which the democratic rights of the people were usurped. The political struggle of the 1960s in Bangladesh were thus driven by four key goals. The restoration of democracy, whereby Bengalis could share power in the central government through drawing upon their democratic majority through the franchise, the realization of self-rule through the acceptance of the principle of autonomy for Bangladesh, the channeling of resources appropriated by the central government towards the development of Bangladesh, and the recognition of Bangla as an integral part of the culture of Bangladesh and as one of the two national languages of Pakistan. These four political themes had a territorial base located in Bangladesh. Thus the concept of democratic assertion coalesced with the notion of a separate identity for the Bengalis. The physical separation between two wings of Pakistan had inspired the idea that Pakistan was a state where two economies, even two societies coexisted within one polity. However, as the political aspirations of the two regions of Pakistan began to diverge, the notion of two polities also began to assert itself in the consciousness of the Bengalis. Thus a Bengali identity associated with language and culture within a state with differentiated economies, polities and societies and located in a country geographically separated by the land mass of India established a unique sense of separateness amongst the Bengalis within Pakistan, which had few parallels in any other state encapsulating multiple national identities. Much of the political struggles of the people of Bangladesh, starting from the language movement of 1952 to the democratic movement of the 60s, were driven by these four salient concerns of the Bengalis of Bangladesh. <laughs> Bongobandhu and the shaping of a national identity. This is my section. This emerging sense of distinctiveness between the people of East and West Pakistan did not automatically evolve into a sense of national identity because the Bengalis of Pakistan still thought of themselves as Pakistanis. It needed a major political effort to weave together these various notions of separateness within the consciousness of the Bengalis into a sense of shared nationhood. Whilst a number of historic political figures, such as H.S. Suravardi, Shere Bangla Fazlul Haq, and Maulana Bhashani, played a vanguard role in the political struggle of the people of Bangladesh. The catalytic act of political entrepreneurship needed to forge a sense of nationhood for the Bengalis was provided by Bangabandhu. From the period in 1966, when Bangabandhu launched the sixth program, down to the defining two-year period from March 1969 to the end of March 1971, in the course of an election campaign of unique historical significance, Bangabandhu played a dominant role in the struggle for self-rule for the Bengalis. The, now I talk about the de his role in democratizing the struggle. Identity has to be consolidated through a process of democratic struggle. The mobilization around the demand for Bengali as the national language had played a vital role in the national struggle. However, Bangabandhu recognized that it was around issues of the people's livelihood that, that the sense of deprivation rankled most deeply. Deprivation was made visible in the disparate levels of living between the peoples 
of West and East Pakistan, and in the disparity in levels of development resulting from the inequitable allocation of public resources in favor of West Pakistan. Bangabandhu played a catalytic role in institutionalizing this growing sense of deprivation. In focusing on the issue of economic deprivation, Bangabandhu could draw upon a body of work on issues of regional disparity presented both as academic papers and through more popular presentations by some Bengali economists, mostly associated with Dhaka University. Uh, I was privileged to be uh, part of this group. Some of the economists had already propagated the idea that Pakistan should be conceptualized as a state with two economies, whose unique problem should be addressed through a high degree of devolution of policy making and resource mobilization invested with the respective regional governments. Bongobandhu drew on these arguments on disparity as well as devolution in preparing and presenting his historic six point program before the people of Pakistan in the spring of 1966. His program, the six point program eventually became the Magna Carta of the struggle for self rule for the Bengali. Here again, timing was all important. Pakistan provoked and fought a war with India in the last quarter of 1965, where it had narrowly saved itself from military defeat by signing a peace treaty with India, brokered by the USSR in Tashkent. During this short war, Bangladesh was left completely defenseless. And, and when that its defense had been outsourced to China. This was a fiction in 1965 and was to again prove so in 1971 with more fatal consequences for Pakistan. But Bhutto's message confirmed to the people of Bangladesh the long standing duplicity of the argument of Pakistan's ruling elite that Bangladesh's export earnings were being used to build up a strong Pakistan army which would, which would assure our defense by destroying the Indian army in the West in any such military confrontation. The six point program provided the constitutional parameters for complete autonomy for the two regions. Four of the six points focused exclusively on the devolution of economic power. The six points reflected for the first time a formal recognition by a major Bengali political leader that political coexistence between East and, and West Pakistan, even within a democratic central government, was not a feasible option for the people of Bangladesh. Only through a devolution of political power, policy making, and administrative authority, as well as command over economic resources, could the two provinces of Pakistan hope to survive within a single nation state. Interesting to note, the six point program had a historical precedent in the cabinet mission plan of 1946, where a political mission sent by the Labour Party, which had been elected to power in Great Britain in 1945, offered a constitutional formula for post-independence India to resolve the Congress, Congress Muslim League conflict which had stalemated the negotiations for India's independence from British rule. The cabinet mission presented a constitutional formula before India's political leaders based on a devolution of central power to three component regions of Northwest India, Central and Eastern India. The cabinet mission plan was based on a recognition of a separate political identity dividing the Muslim and Hindu community in India and just chose to devolve power to the regions where each of these communities was respect, respectively in a majority. <clears throat> this formula was initially challenged by the Cong Congress party because the extreme degree of autonomy to be ceded to the regions was unacceptable to them. And so the plan was also subsequently repudiated by the Muslim League. The partition of India leading to the emergence of Pakistan as a separate nation state, thus originated in a breakdown in the constitutional negotiations over the extent of devolution 
under a prospective federal constitution in an independent India, and not because the Muslims were determined to proclaim themselves as a separate nation state. Ironically, Pakistan again broke up and Bangladesh emerged as a nation state, initially because of the reluctance of the Pakistani ruling elite to accept a new revolutionary federal constitution for Pakistan based on the six points. The six points were projected by the Pakistani leadership as a thinly veiled blueprint for secession by Bangladesh. Strangely enough, the Pakistani leadership, including Bhutto, never engaged themselves in a serious dialogue with the Awami League, except in the last few days of United Pakistan on the implications of operationalizing six points. The more substantive concerns of the Pakistani ruling elite originated in their, in their reluctance to re relinquish the absolute power to rule Pakistan. The attempt to suppress the mass political mobilization across Bangladesh in the summer of 1966, associated with the Six Point Program, led to the arrest of Bongo Bandhu, along with most of the Awami League High Command. He was later charged with inspiring the infamous Agartala conspiracy case and tried for high treason. Bangubandhu was kept in jail for two years. It took mass mobilization, uprising in both wings of Pakistan, culminating in the downfall of Ayub Khan to obtain the release of Bangubandhu and his colleagues. The failure of the roundtable talks with the opposition leaders eventually compelled Yahya Khan to hand over power to General uh, to, uh, to Yahya. And Yahya at the end of March 79 had to seek a political accommodation with the opposition in both wings of Pakistan by promising national elections. Even though Pakistan was to be governed by Bashar law, uh, Bongo Bandhu was confident he could win an overwhelming mandate from the people of Bangladesh to frame a constitution based on six points. Uh, now, this is the role of the 1969-70 election campaign in forging a national identity. Pongabandhu calculated that nothing short of an overwhelming mandate from the people of Bangladesh would generate enough pressure on the Pakistani ruling elite to devolve power to Bangladesh under the six-point program. It was believed that such an overwhelming electoral display of support would persuade the military Pijanta of Pakistan, that rejecting and suppressing the universal demand of the people would jeopardize the very foundations of the Pakistan state. This turned out to be a prophetic assumption on the part of Bangabandhu. To build an overwhelming democratic mandate behind six points, demanded total support from the people of Bangladesh, manifested in the polling response of the voters. Historically, all attempts to resist political domination by the Pakistani elite were frustrated by the divisions amongst the political leaders of the Bengalis. Bangabandhu sought to go over the heads of his political rivals in Bangladesh to seek a comprehensive popular mandate for his six points. To build this popular uni unity, it was necessary to forge a common identity for the Bengalis. The main message of Bangabandhu's political campaign after March 1969 was to persuade the Bengalis that not only were they separate in their social, political, and economic life from Pakistan, but that Bengalis of Bangladesh were one people who should vote together to proclaim the right to live a separate life from West Pakistan. To build this mass unity demanded a focus on identity politics and a capacity to project this identity into the consciousness of every villager as well as not enough to build this shared identity within an urban educated middle class, which had hitherto been the principal reference points for political activity in Bangladesh. It was essential to persuade the masses of people across the nation that all Bengalis were being politically oppressed by a Pakistani ruling elite. The key message encapsulated in a political poster put up by the Awami League workers in every village in Bangladesh, Purbo Bangla, Shoshankeno, why is Eastern Bengal a wasteland, 
itemized in sim simple language, the statistics of disparity in oppression between East and West Pakistan. In delivering this simple message to the people of Bangladesh, the role of the Awami League as a party should not be underestimated. Uh, since Bangabandhu's message to the voters did not land on their doorstep by osmosis, but required large-scale party organization and de dedicated work. The role of Tajuddin Ahmed, General Secretary of the Awami League and right hand of Bangabandhu, as well as other key figures and dedicated workers should also be recognized. Over the two-year period, Bangabandhu emerged as the unchallenged leader and the embodiment of the national will of the people of Bangladesh. In this period, he graduated from being the leader of a political party into a national icon for the Bengalis of Bangladesh. Wherever he went, the entire population of the area, men and women, old and young, assembled just to obtain a glimpse of this near mythic figure. Without his presence, the Awami League would have still won the election. But it was Bangabandhu in short, the overwhelming support of the voters for Awami League candidates, because in his person, he transcended his party and came to represent the aspirations of all Bengalis. Uh, here again, I wish to point out that I speak from first-hand experience because I accompanied him on many of these campaigns and I witnessed what I'm writing about. This emphasis on the role of Bangabandhu should not again detract from the growing receptiveness of the people to this message of self-assertion over a long period of time. The total support of the people of Bangladesh for Bangabandhu was manifest in the election of December 1970, where the Awami League not only won 167 out of 169 seats contested from Bangladesh, but also 75% of the vote. More to that point, it won large pluralities in virtually every constituency where it was successful, thereby minimizing the contribution of such events as the November 1970 cyclone in determining the size of the majority vote. The political outcome of the December 1970 election had given the Awami League an absolute majority in the National Assembly of Pakistan, as well as total control of the Provincial Assembly. And it clearly demonstrated that the voters of Bangladesh had unreservedly endorsed the six point program. The election had proclaimed to the world that the Bengalis had forged a collective identity and that they had invested Bangabandhu with total authority to realize self rule for Bangladesh. Thus, what had originally been a political demand for constitutional autonomy had culminated in planting the seeds of a nation state in the hearts and minds of the people of Bangladesh. These far reaching implications had arisen out of the election campaign and its outcome in December were not fully appreciated by the ruling elite of Pakistan, including Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. Neither Bhutto or Yahya had foreseen that implicit <coughs> sorry that implicit in the had foreseen the over the overwhelming electoral victory of the Awami League. Nor did they recognize that the authority commanded by Bangabandhu over the people. Both Yahya and Bhutto had deluded themselves that the election results were an urban middle-class phenomenon fueled by Bengali emotionalism and influenced by the adverse reaction to the November 1970 cyclone. Until both Bhutto and Yahya met Bangabandhu in Dhaka in early 1970, they believed like, that like previous Bengali leaders before him, he could be persuaded to compromise his six-point demand. The West Pakistani leaders failed to recognize the seismic changes which had been registered in the self-awareness of the people of Bangladesh between March 1969 and March 1971. They did not realize that as a result of the elections in December, the six points had become the minimalist demand for a constitutional solution to the unfolding political crisis. 
as a consequence of this newfound sense of nationalism in Bangladesh, voices were being raised after the elections, even within the Awami League, for full political independence. Yeah. We appear to have lost uh, Professor Soban again. Um, I apologize for inconvenience caused. Um, Sunil in the South Asia Institute will be on the case. Please be patient with us. I think Professor Subhan has covered first two points. He was about to talk on emergence of Bangladesh. And the last was vision for Bangladesh. I think he's covered the first two. Welcome back, Professor Subham. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. All right. Right. Sorry. Okay. Yahya's decision of 1st March 1971 to CNDA postpone the inaugural National Assembly scheduled to meet in Dhaka on 3rd March was viewed by all Bengalis as the end result of the conspiracy to deny them their democratic mandate registered in the elections of December 1970. Here I move on to the, the emergence of the Bangladesh nation state. Bangabandhu's response to the decision by Yahya to postpone the assembly session was to call, call for a political mobilization throughout Bangladesh. Uh, the popular response in Bangladesh to his call registered a measure of support, which remains without precedent in the history of democratic and liberation movements. The non-cooperation movement was spontaneously joined, not just by the people of Bangladesh, but by the administrative and judicial machinery, the forces of law and order, as well as the business community. The non-cooperation movement eventually graduated in a formal shift of allegiance of the machinery of civilian government in Bangladesh, away from the central government of General Yahya Khan to the authority exercised by Bangabandhu over Bangladesh. Eventually the entire machinery of state Locating out, located outside the military cantonments of Bangladesh, unanimously came forward to pledge their loyalty to the leadership of Bangabandhu. I quote here the resignation letter of the Chief Martial Law Administrator, Lieutenant General Yahu Khan, when he decided that the force would not work. The control of the administration has now passed on to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman who is now de facto head of government and controls all public life. I am convinced there is no military solution which can make sense in the present situation. In consequence, I am unable to accept the responsibility for implementing a mission, namely a military solution, which would merely lead to large scale killing of unarmed civilians and would achieve no same aim. It would have disastrous consequence. This was in his resignation letter to Yahya Khan. 
By 5th March 1971, all troops had been withdrawn into the cantonment by Yahoo. Bangabandhu had found himself the unchallenged ruler of Bangladesh and the entire machinery of Bangladesh behind him. In no other independence movement had such a shift of loyalty emerged prior to the recognition of national independence. Bangladesh's de facto independence thus emerged as part of a process where between 1st March and 15th March, when Yahya finally flew into Bangladesh to initiate negotiations with Bangabandhu, Bangladesh had assumed all the correlates of an independent state. So total was the non-cooperation movement that the economy and infrastructure of Bangladesh came near to collapse with life-threatening consequences for the people of this region. Thus, Bangabandhu had of necessity to escalate the movement from non-cooperation to self-rule in order to restore economic activity and maintain law and order. A rudimentary policy-making apparatus had to be established by him to take decisions about selective revival of the economy and establishment of administrative authority. <clears throat> Many ad hoc problems of a administrative political or commission nature, which needed resolution, were presented to him at his private residence in Dhan Mandi. Uh, the machinery of law and order was restored as the police began to take orders from Bongo Bandhu and to work in cooperation with Awami League workers to restore a sense of security to the people. <clears throat> By the 15th of March, for all practical purposes, a functioning administration operating under the direction of Bongo Bandhu and administered by key of Army League court beaks, had emerged as a de facto administration and political authority in Bangladesh. It is arguable indeed that Bangladesh's authority, Bangabandhu's authority was not just de facto, but could be termed de jure, since his leadership enjoyed electoral legitimacy, registered in the overwhelming vote of the population, endorsing their political confidence in Bangabandhu. This exercise of political administrative authority by Bangabandhu over the entire geographical area of Bangladesh was more than enough to meet the criteria for sovereign recognition by a foreign government. This exercise of authority by Bangabandhu throughout Bangladesh was projected before the world through a large contingent of the international press who were present in Bangladesh to cover what appeared to be the emergence of a new state. Bangabandhu was at the same time communicating with government leaders who were believed to exercise some leverage over the Pakistan government to seek their assistance in persuading Yahya to accept the logic of the democratic process in Bangladesh. The world press regularly projected Bangabandhu's message to the ordinary people of these countries so that Sheikh Mujib or Rahman during March 1971 became one of, one of the most globally visible personalities in the third world. When Yahya Khan arrived in Bangladesh in mid-March to resume political negotiations for a constitutional solution to the crisis, he was thus no longer negotiating with a subject, but with a political equal. Bangabandhu at that point was not only sovereign in Bangladesh, but commanded more authority in his own territory than Yahya did in West Pakistan. If such negotiations between Bangabandhu and Yahya had been carried out on the basis of political realities which prevailed on the ground in Bangladesh, a peaceful solution to the political crisis might have emerged. Such a solution may have ended in a loose confederal arrangement, which may have eventually led to a peaceful parting of Bangladesh from Pakistan. Political rationality had unfortunately long since been abandoned in the negotiating of arsenal of the Pakistani leadership. Yahya Khan, goaded by Bhutto and some of the hawks in the junta, still persisted with his delusion that a show of force would bring these middle-class Bengali leaders to their senses, or that some of them would come forward over the dead body bodies of their colleagues to seek a compromise with the military. The junta did not believe that the Bengalis had the political cohesion, courage, tradition, or military capacity to sustain a war of national liberation. To the end, they could not comprehend 
that a nation state had been forged within Bangladesh during March 1971, where people would be willing to fight spontaneously to protect their sovereignty. At the back of their minds, both Yahya and Bhutto believed that if worse comes to worse, Pakistan would leave Bangladesh a scorched earth where the Bengalis would pay in fire and blood for their presumptions of sovereignty. As it transpired, Yahya used the cover of political negotiations to move troops into Bangladesh to build up enough force to suppress what he believed was enough force to suppress the forces of Bengali nationalism. By the time Yahya gave its final orders to General Tikka Khan to launch Operation Searchlight, his military code word for committing genocide on the Bengalis on the night of March 1971. It was Pakistan which was the usurper of authority from the democratically established sovereign state of Bangladesh. Thus, the armed assault of the Pakistani armed forces on the Bengalis was seen as an act of military aggression by one sovereign state on another. This was how the Bengalis viewed the assault on their sovereignty, and indeed how much of the world viewed the military aggression against Bangladesh. <laughs> by the 25th of March, Bangladesh was already a sovereign state in the minds of its citizens. The proclamation of independence by Bandhu on 26 March in response to the military assault on the Bengalis was a juridical act recognizing a de facto and legitimate authority. The post-liberation debate over who declared independence of Bangladesh is thus a largely irrelevant debate. It is self-evident to anyone with common sense that the operative issue is not who declared independence, but when Bangladeshis asserted their own independence, which they did during the month of March 1971. The legitimacy derived from the unchallenged authority of Bongo Bundu was crucial to the sustainability of the liberation war. At the time that Bangladesh was, independence was formally declared on 26 March, uh, Bongo Bundu commanded what few of any leaders of independence movements have commanded during their phase of struggle with an imperial authority. The freely given an overwhelming electoral mandate to speak for Bangladesh. Such a mandate was not available to Gandhi or Nehru or Mao or Ho Chi Minh or Ben Bela or Nkrumah or Nairere or even to Mandela, all of whom obtained full electoral legitimacy only after independence. Bongo Bandhu had already exercised de facto authority in the eyes of the world over the territory of Bangladesh when he, when he proclaimed Bangladesh's independence. Uh, Bengali members of the armed forces were at that stage willing to break their oath of service and pledge their allegiance to the liberation of Bangladesh. Today, the genocide unleashed by Yahya and the Pakistan army would have been condemned by many governments and they would have been in global outcry. In 1971, most governments with rare exceptions still believed that the state, that a state, however weak its popular legitimacy, could massacre its own citizens with impunity. Thus, in 1971, Bang Bangladesh needed to invoke the support of the people of these countries who would in normal times have never heard of Bangladesh. The global campaign to reach out to the elected representatives to exercise pressure had a big impact on, on getting governments to come forward and pressurizing Bangladesh to stop the genocide. But this global campaign was greatly facilitated by the visibility and the acceptance of Bongo Bandhu as the leader of Bangladesh at that time. Now, let me uh, point out that Amarjan as a sovereign state demanded the complete involvement of the people of Bangladesh the consolidation of a sense of national sovereignty in the minds of the people of Bangladesh was not the skin deep process one associates with formal declarations of independence, where ordinary people find one day that white skinned rulers have been replaced by brown sahibs. 
In the case of Bangladesh, national sovereignty was inculcated in the consciousness. It was the mass character of this consciousness building which provided the underlying strength to the nationalist movement. During March 71, Bangladeshis at all levels drawn from all faiths and social backgrounds participated in the mobilization repudiating the authority. In every village, a sense of Bangladesh's sovereign status took root and people became psychologically prepared to defend their sovereignty. In those days of March, citizens were acutely conscious of the threat of a military attack by the Pakistan army. Even within the cantonments, where preparations were attacked were visible to all Bengali members, their rank and file, along with their officers, had within their hearts and minds proclaimed their loyalty to a sovereign Bangladesh under the leadership of Bangabandhu. When the Pakistan army launched its aggression on the people of Bangladesh on the night of March 25th, the entire population spontaneously rose up to resist this, even without any coordinating military direction. Two years of political mobilization by Bangabandhu had made them conscious of their identity. The exposure to self-rule in March 71 had made them a nation. The intense process of national consciousness building throughout March politically equipped a people with no tradition of armed struggle or even the use of arms to take up arms and be prepared to shed their blood to defend their newly acquired sovereignty. Let me now end quickly. Uh, the shaping of a vision for Bangladesh. The liberation struggle had a defining impact on Bangabandhu's vision for an independent Bangladesh. The struggle had inculcated a sense of national identity into the consciousness of all Bengalis. Ironically, the genocide by the Pakistan army, which did not discriminate between Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or Christian, further reaffirmed our sense of nationhood. Bangabandhu recognized the importance of sustaining this national consciousness by re-emphasizing the importance of secularism, where religion could no longer abuse for political gain or to commit mass murder. The centrality of democracy was no less important in defining Bangabandhu's vision, but his idea of democracy embrace the inclusion of the masses of Bangladesh, who had provided both width and depth to the liberation struggle, to give it the strength to withstand the might and extreme violence of the Pakistan army. In post-liberation Bang Bangladesh, Bangabandhu envisaged a democratic order, which would, which would not be exposed to elite capture or could be made purchasable by the power of wealth. In the final analysis, all these dimensions of nationhood were subsumed in his vision for a more just society in reaching out to a mass constituency which could draw in the working classes of the urban areas as well as the rural masses. Bongo Bondu was conscious of the need to offer these new elements in his support base something more than the prospect of self-rule. He had at an early stage of his political journey been made aware of how the Pakistan movement had been hijacked by a Pakistani ruling elite, made up of landlords and aspirant business elite, the armed forces, and senior bureaucracy. But what most people tend to overlook is Bangabandhu's lifelong empathy with the common people. More than most leaders in his own life and his Herculean campaign to organize the Awami League party, he had first-hand exposure to the unjust and exploitative nature of the society in which the common people lived out their lives. From his earliest writings in his prison diaries, he speaks of socialism as an instrument to end such exploitation. Thus for Bangabandhu, the idea of a just society was not just about ending the exploitation of the Pakistani elite, but of eradicating it from the social order of a self-rule Bangladesh. When I was invited by Bangabandhu to work with Tajuddin Ahmed and Kamal Hussain to prepare the election manifesto for the 1970 election campaign, Bangabandhu specially alerted us to prepare a document which would construct a more egalitarian, exploitation-free society. 
the belief amongst the Bengali progressive circles that Bangabandhu was a mouthpiece of the aspirant Bengali bourgeoisie was irrevocably put to rest once the 1970 manifesto was published and subsequently validated by Bangabandhu's own actions. As was the case after the Awami League victory in the 1970 election, so was the expectation once Bangladesh was liberated that Bangabandhu would now moderate his views and revert to the traditional role of all post-colonial leaders who made extravagant pro promises during the course of the struggle, but then settled down to deploy state resources and policies to build up an elite class in the image of the social order that had been left behind. When the same economists who were associated by Bangabandhu in operationalizing a six point program and preparing the AL manifesto, were invited to take on the role of members of, mem of the planning commission, his mandate to us remained reconstructed. His first words to Nurul Islam and me when he invited us to set up the planning commission on 12 January 1972, was that he wanted to pursue a socialist policy. Bangabandhu's vision of socialism was expressed essentially as a metaphor for his vision of a just, exploitation-free, more egalitarian society. Bangabandhu's compulsion to repudiate the inegalitarian, unjust society he had left behind in Pakistan was made stronger through his experience of the liberation war. He was conscious of the fact that the masses had been mobilized by him to participate in the struggle for self-rule. They had paid the heaviest price through directly taking up arms in the liberation war and as the principal victims of the genocide inflicted on the people of Pakistan by the Pakistan army. Since 15th March, 1975, Bangladesh society and econ economy have been involved in a direction which remains somewhat contrary to Bangabandhu's image. In recent years, the economy has indeed demonstrated robust GDP export growth, structural changes, considerable improvement in its human development indicators, and reduction in poverty. All such developments certainly demonstrate the many advantages we have re realized through our independence and particularly in the big advances made in recent years. But there's little argument that over the years, Bangladesh has emerged as a more inegalitarian society with its elective bodies subject to elite capture. What we need to explore in the days ahead is how far high growth and impressive infrastructure development can only be realized within the framework of a hierarchical social order based on a privileged business elite. Perhaps more relevant to our commemoration of Bangabandhu's centenary and for honoring his vision is the importance of exploring what can be done to reconcile our de developmental ambitions with the mission of the founding father to build a just society. Such a perspective could perhaps serve as one of the guiding principles when we seek to set the direction for Bangladesh on its 50th anniversary, on its path towards a developed economy, a genuinely democratic polity and a more just society. Thank you. Professor Suban, thank you very much. Uh, as the High Commissioner is, is indicating, we've not yet developed a clapping function for Zoom, which is a little bit of a shame. I, for those of you who are in the audience, I, I would like you to be aware that you just listened to a remarkable lecture of momentous events, very lightly told, um, which was an incredible achievement. So thank you very much. For those of you in the audience who might have questions, we have a Q&A function available at the bottom of the screen. Uh, a few questions have already come. Most of those are for Professor Suban, but uh, one or two of those might also be usefully directed at the High Commissioner if she has no objection. But as a, our special guest, I'd like to ask the High Commissioner first if she has any questions she would like to put to Professor Suban before we open the floor to a general Q&A. High Commissioner.
<coughs> sorry. I just want to express my gratitude to Professor Iman Subhan for <coughs> delivering such a wonderful, such an analytical, socio-political, uh, you know, socio-psychological explanation of what you know he structured it in four chapters. And uh, this generation, in particular, our generation, is so much devoid of this knowledge. You know, this institutional memory, the socio-political picture, uh, particularly, you know. Uh, how Bengalis were looked down upon by uh, you know, Pakistani elite. We've only read about it from few, uh, I would say, uh, books that are available, but uh, I wanted to know uh, if Professor Iman Sawan would write on it. Uh, would there be a book where he analyzes all this? Because for our succeeding generations, it's extremely important to learn from these lessons uh, so that we do not repeat such things in our national history. So um, if he would, and I wanted to understand that quite often when I'm supposed to talk about these issues on Bangabundhu and the Bangladesh Liberation War, if I say this was a racial discrimination, would he agree it was a racial discrimination? Were we being discriminated because we are Bengalis? Was there this, you keep on mentioning that the middle-class Bengalis, you know, the underestimating of, you know, whether they would be able to do this armed um, struggle, they're very peaceful people, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, whether, and we've always been an egalitarian society, but uh, particularly, you know, 60s, 70s, those times. So um, was, was it a racial discrimination? Was it a case of racial discrimination? And uh, also the genocide that you spoke about a little bit, if you, you know, there was no recognition of Bangladesh's, international recognition of Bangladesh's genocide. But uh, what is your recommendation? How do we internationalize it? Uh, it's very important that, you know, this is 50th anniversary of our independence. And if you reflect back, uh, this is something that uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has tried to do many times. But uh, as you know, the case that, you know, uh, we, we, we did our international crimes tribunal, and of course we would. This, is, this was a, it needed a closure. But uh, at the same time, uh, what we are trying to do here in London on the 25th, we'll have a talk on this. And in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Ronuk, Jahan will speak on it, but how can we achieve international recognition that, you know, there was genocide committed on the soil of Bangladesh? Um, I will just stop there. Thank you. Mel, thank you. I mean, as far as my writings are concerned, uh, I have um, covered quite a bit of ground in my first memoir, uh, Untranquil Recollections, uh, which covers my journey up to the end of uh, December 1971. And I also have another book of writings from two economies to two nations, my journey to Bangladesh. So if you have access to those, you can please get my thoughts on the subject. Others have also written on it. Uh, so would you write something on the occasion of the centenary of the Bangabundhu? I have written a lot, actually. In, fact, in a book, uh, so we can fact, compile it. Yes, in fact, uh, Ronak and I, Ronak has written even more than I have. And we are putting together all our various writings and are bringing it out in a slim volume. But uh, as far as the issue of genocide is concerned, I would suggest that uh, you should uh, wait till 25th uh, when Ronak will be giving her lecture because she in fact is an authority in this subject and has been of course discussing this issue of the recognition of genocide and what are the conditions required for that. Okay, wonderful. We, Hi, Commissioner, did you want to come back? Uh, no, thank oh, you. I mean, I, I, when I thought of it as a ethnic thing. Well, I suppose Bengalis, Bengali is more of a cultural category than an ethnic group, but I suppose there would be an element of race involved in this. So I suppose we aren't uh, really a race by any objective sense of the term, as far as I know. But we are clearly the identified uh, identity group. And that was, I think, what was highlighted in the genocide. And sir, would you have a message for the new generation, you know, the, the present generation of Bangladeshi youth? Uh, if they are to relate to 1971 and the, and the history that you just uh, spoke of, what would, what would be their take from this, the lessons learned, things that they shouldn't repeat? Well, I think... Uh, 
the main message which he conveyed throughout his life was the need for justice. And you should have both political justice through democracy, and more important, you should have social justice so that in fact, uh, there will be no sense of communal or cultural discrimination. And above all, you should really have uh, economic justice so that all people would in fact face their struggles in life through a democratization of economic opportunities. And I think this is something which he began by fighting it for Bengalis at the regional level, but it transcended into a social struggle. And I think this was his spotting message to all of us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a number of other questions uh, that have appeared in the Q&A section. I won't take them in the order in which they have appeared. Um, I'll, I'll impose my own order on them. I apologize to the question askers for doing that. The first one I'd like to take is from uh, Syed Inam, who asks, uh, Professor Soban hasn't mentioned the 11 point demand of the student movement. Um, could you comment on the idea that the 11 point um, student thing led to the uh, adoption of socialism as a constitutional goal for the economy of Bangladesh? Okay. Uh, right. Well, yes. the 11 point demand was certainly joined with the six point demand and became a common demand. But as far as socialism was concerned, uh, Bongo Bandhu himself was advocating socialism long before anyone had ever heard of the 11 point or even the six point demand. And in fact, if you read his prison diaries, he was in fact actually articulating the need for an exploitation free society. I think his latest work about his visit to China, which is the Bangla version has come out, but the English version is also about coming out. He expresses this very strongly, where he was greatly impressed by his visit to a socialist China in 1952. Uh, I mean, the concept of socialism has of course been part of the Awami League discourse uh, as we are now discovering, as we are digging in Ronak, Jahan is the leading researcher into the archives and finding that references to socialism going back to the foundational documents of the Iwami League and then eventually into the 21 point program in 1954 had already been art articulated. So uh, whilst I suppose uh, those from the left who were uh, associated with the 11 point program would like to feel that they had a contribution to it. I would say that, well, they did at that time, but the antecedents as far as Bangabundu was concerned were far older than to the extent that uh, people like myself were part of this discourse. I would think that we were teaching socialism to the people who were incorporating it into the 11 point program. Thank you very much. So the next question uh, is from Ghulam Ali, and I will direct it perhaps both to Professor Soban and the uh, High Commissioner. Uh, Ali, who did a master's degree at SOAS, he tells us, writes, um, an overwhelming majority of Pakistanis today acknowledge the atrocities and injustices committed against people of formerly East Pakistan. Do you not think that there is a need to use this realization on the part of the Pakistani public politicians and intellectuals to make room for a grand reconciliation between two nations? There hardly exist any significant channels of communication between the people of both nations. This wound now needs to be healed. What would you propose in this regard? Well, I think the crucial problem is that the successive Bangladesh regimes have always made the point that they would want a recognition of what happened in 71 and an apology for what happened in 71 from the leadership. But historically, this is never going to come because as long as the Pakistan state is uh, held captive 
uh, in the hands of, you may say, its real rulers, the uh, gentlemen in uniform, uh, it is going to be very difficult for even democratically elected governments who may be interested in reconciliation uh, to, in fact, actually uh, come forward and to register the formal apology and the recognition of the wrongs of 71 uh, for, in fact, creating the basis of a reconciliation. So I think this has remained the problem. And uh, I'm not quite sure what the way out for this is beyond any significant change coming about. But one would hope uh, that this should not be prejudicial to people coming together at the level of citizens. And I've certainly had occasion to visit Pakistan. Pakistanis have visited here and most, quite a few of us congregate within the framework of uh, South Asia initiatives. Uh, and these are ways in which we can move forward. But the objective reality remains that there has to be a recognition within the leadership of Pakistan uh, about this problem and to use that as the basis on which to construct a new pattern of relationships. Hi, Commissioner, would you like to answer? I, I direct the question to you just because you, you might have some different form of response. Not at all. I think Professor Mansabhan has uh, encapsulated uh, Bangladesh's uh, state position because uh, throughout successive Pakistan governments, uh, Bangladesh governments have, every time there was an official visit, an opportunity for this kind of uh, apology. And that was the most important thing. As you know that Professor Mansabhan also recalls, that I'm sure he'll recall that there was an economic uh, account that was, you know, there was no state succession. So Pakistan's central bank had quite a large number of reserves sold from Bangladesh jute exports and other exports. So that was never resolved. But then one thing that Bangladesh insisted is an apology and a recognition that such crimes have been committed and uh, you know, crimes against humanity, et cetera. But since that never came, we never went to the next step. So uh, each time there would be a high level visit, these issues will come into the, come onto the agenda, but uh, we never saw any initiative on the other side. So I just add to his voice. Okay. Thank you. So we have two, two questions now um, relating in different ways to India. The first one is from Math uh, Rakesh Mathur, uh, who writes, he was looking forward to hearing something about India's role in Bangladesh gaining freedom. What about the state of Bihari Muslims after the creation of Bangladesh? That's the first part of it. So that's a quite a specific question. And then the second one from William Crawley is much more wide ranging. And I can imagine there might be a second book on this. Uh, and that is to what extent did Gandhi's economic ideas and Gandhi's idea of socialism influence Sheikh Mujibur Rahman? I see, okay. Uh, so uh, the first one is Rakesh Mathur. Well, of course, uh, this wasn't about the overview of the whole liberation war. In fact, I have written about India in two memoirs of mine. The first one, I point, I point out that I was in fact one of the first people to arrive in Delhi and to open up discussions with the leadership of India. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Tajuddin came there at that time and he opened up relations. But I had gone there just at the beginning of April and in fact had met with Mr. P. N. Haksar and other influential people over there to educate them about what happened to Bang in Bangladesh. And I was of course also involved with building up relations with India during my days in the planning commission. So this is part of a Another story, and of course, uh, Professor Raghavan has written an excellent book on that subject, which I would certainly advise you to read. Uh, as far as the, what was the other part of the question? Um, also, about the influence of Gandhi. About the influence of Gandhi. Oh, well, actually, what was interesting was that 
Bongo Bandhu was, if anything, more influenced by Gandhi's post-46 uh, uh, commitment to avoiding communal conflict. And of course, uh, there are these historic photographs uh, of uh, Bongo Bandhu standing uh, in the room behind uh, Gandhi and Mr. Soravardi, where they were having this fast in Belia Gata. Uh, in Kolkata to in fact actually stop the riot. And since Bangabandhu was a self-claimed disciple of Mr. Sodawardi, he went along over there and was a great believer there. And when he decided to go back to Bangladesh, uh, to Pakistan, East, East Bengal, uh, in, at the end of 47, Mr. Sodawardi advised him that one of the first things you should engage yourself in is to ensure that no communal riots take place there because otherwise there will be a huge exodus of Hindus uh, in, uh, into uh, West Bengal, which will further aggravate communal tensions over here. So he, his first mission was in fact a Gandhian mission to in fact actually uh, try to stop uh, communal conflict uh, in the new state of Pakistan. As far as his vision of socialism was concerned, I haven't really come across, I mean, he was a great admirer of the Mahatma, but I have come across no real evidence to suggest that he drew any direct inspiration from uh, the Mahatma's ideas uh, of socialism or of a just society, which had their own unique features. Uh, so Bongo Bandhu's ideas about socialism went along a more conventional lines, though I don't think he was a, a great believer in all these sort of hard lines, sort of theoretical constructs of uh, what uh, the sort of conventional uh, socialist discourse really presented. He essentially addressed the values of a socialist society and took quite seriously the institutional initi initiatives which are demanded for in fact really creating a more just society. So. The concept of social ownership of the means of production, the concept of uh, bringing about uh, cooperatives in the rural agricultural, in the rural areas, these were all area, ideas which were very closely held by him. This belief in uh, worker participation in management and benefits of production, all these were the ideas he believed in, he wrote about, and he spoke about. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is unfortunately um, listed by as an anonymous attendee, um, and I'll paraphrase it rather than reading it directly because I think it's an interesting question. And the, the question is something along the lines of um, Sheikh Mujib's vision was just and democratic. How, how do you practically and intellectually um, reconcile those ideals with a darker side to do with opposition, control of the press and political parties and the institution of one man rule prior to his end. So there's, con how, do you, how do you bring together those contrasting ideas and explain them within a political narrative? Well, I think uh, as far as the social component, the social economic component was concerned, whatever vision he articulated through what he was, he's obviously referring to as the Baksal program uh, is of course projected over there. I mean, if ever at any point in time, he came forward with the body of ideas, demonstrating his idea of uh, bringing about justice in the rural economy, uh, this was there. But his democratic agenda, as it initially emerged in the Baksal program, obviously was not consistent with his lifelong beliefs and his commitment to uh, a democratic order. I mean, after all, I can think of no person who has struggled for longer in his life and had suffered so much uh, in his struggle for democracy, the whole struggle for Bangladesh itself evolved out of his struggle for democracy and the denial of democracy and ultimately the liberation of Bangladesh 
the liberation war itself, emerged out of the ultimate denial of the democratic mandate which he had earned through his election campaign. So we have still, we still remain, uh, attempt, we still attempt to in fact understand the last phase of his life. But what I would like to point out is that I do not really believe that that part of his agenda was his last word on the subject of the political society which he wished to construct uh, in his uh, vision for Bangladesh. I think what we saw was uh, intervention for a brief period of time, how he would in fact have modified and developed it over a period of time uh, is less clear. I mean, there are various hypotheses which suggest that his main objective at that time was to bring in a much broader constituency of support, drawing from the uh, younger, more radical elements from other political parties, including uh, those who in fact had once been with him and had now gone on to constitute uh, what came to be known as Joshua. And that once he had brought them together uh, within a common framework, uh, it is possible that he may have uh, redirected his agenda back to his sort of lifelong commitment to a democratic process. But all this remains speculative. And uh, what he had in mind, where he was willing to take it, uh, we can do no more than speculate. So I would really not want to say much more about this because the very move that he took at that time uh, remained uh, unclear to many of us. And quite a few of us believe that actually most of the powers that he appropriated at that time uh, actually were already available to him because he was a all powerful and unchallenged leader through the democratic process itself with no real contestation open to him. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, he went down a particular path and where that path would have led, we have to leave this open to speculation and if anyone can unearth any further documents on what was behind this, I would be interested to learn about it. I think that's an excellent answer to a difficult question, but you've also taken the question very directly, so thank you. Um, the final question I'm going to take from the Q&A before we go to Noor for a vote of thanks is from uh, Saif Osmani, and I'll put it to both uh, Professor Sovan and the High, High Commissioner just to see what um, comes out. Uh, Saif Osmani says, hello, at the Migrant Memory and Postcolonial Imagination Research Project, we're looking for personal cultural objects that represent Bangladesh over the years. And then there's a link to the website, which is called Memories of Partition, uh, Bangladesh through 50 objects. So the question for the panelists is what personal objects or heirlooms remind you of the period of the creation of Bangladesh? Hmm. My goodness. Oh. I'll tell you one which has nothing to do with Bangladesh. <laughs> uh, throughout 1969, uh, when I was campaigning for stoppage of aid to Pakistan in recognition of Bangladesh, in, uh, in, throughout 1971, I had been sent out as an envoy by the uh, Bangladesh government uh, in exile. Uh, throughout the campaign, when I was in the United States, uh, I kept hearing on the soundtracks a song by Aretha Franklin called Spanish Harlem. And that tune of Spanish Harlem has remained in my, in my mind for 50 years. But I don't think that would be a very uh, suitable symbol for the sort of collection that you are having. So I would have thought that the uh, symbol for that particular period 
would I think be the uh, bandana, the red bandana tied around the forehead of the freedom fighter. I think that would be a very evocative image uh, of the liberation war. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Professor, if you'll allow me, I would just like to add to uh, two questions that was given to Professor Suvan before. One was uh, role of India. The other one was, I think, influence of Gandhi, and it was followed by the uh, what was the status of the Bihari. So I'd like to respond to that. Now come from the last. So the question of Bihari, whoever has asked that. So as you know that the Bihari people or you know, the stranded Pakistanis is the official term used by uh, Bangladeshi uh, government, Bangladesh government, which is, they were the ones who gave an option to the ICRC. Uh, they were called the Geneva camps and they were created as humanitarian camps during the war. And um, you know, those uh, people who opted that they want to go back to Pakistan uh, and they would prefer a Pakistani uh, passport and identity and they don't want to be a part of the newly independent Bangladesh. So that was the choice. And for that, it was an unresolved issue and again, uh, amongst the four unresolved issues between Bangladesh and Pakistan uh, after the independence, each time there would be high level visit, this would come up and Bangladesh would ask the Pakistan government, these are your people, they want to be part of Pakistan, please take them back. But uh, they were refused, there were successive refusals. And eventually the new generations of uh, that, that particular uh, residents of those camps, they had, uh, they had you know, asked for the right to have Bangladeshi citizenship and those who are born in the soil of Bangladesh. And the Bangladesh courts have given a verdict that those who are born on the soil of Bangladesh should be given Bangladeshi citizenship. So now they have been given Bangladeshi citizenship. There's a small number of seniors who still want to be part of Pakistan. They continue to deny, you know, they, they refuse to take the uh, passport to Bangladesh, but the new generations uh, are hold Bangladeshi passports. So we have given them that right. Uh, so that's the current status of the of these people, uh, the stranded Pakistanis or the Biharis. And um, regarding you know uh, influence of Mahatma, now this is an area of my interest in particular. So if you read the unfinished memoir of uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, there's a good chapter on what happened during the riots in Kolkata, the great uh, Kolkata killings. And um, at that time, he was a student of Islamia College, and uh, the role that he played. He tried to provide, you know, he had this um, hospices with his friends that they would create and support the people, whether it's Hindu or Muslim. In fact, that is a basic, of course, he was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. He was inspired by his nonviolence, his uh, vision that, you know, he, there should not be Hindu-Muslim uh, riots in Calcutta. And that's why Gandhi rushed there. And he did join the peace mission of the Gandhi. And he did participate with his political guru, Sarwardi. Uh, he went there twice. And in the mem autobiography, uh, in, in the unfinished memoir, he writes that he and his photographer friend had made, they decided that we have to give the true picture of what kind of violence took place between Hindus and Muslims, so unfortunately. And they took those photographs, made an album, and they presented it to the Gandhi. And uh, he, they wanted Mahatma to understand what has come of this partition. And that is exactly why Bongo Buddha didn't want the political rights to be repeated. And Professor Iman Suman just mentioned that Hussain Sahib Sarawadi told him that go back to Bangladesh, but make sure that Bangladesh, this kind of political rights, uh, sorry, uh, religious rights are not repeated in Bangladesh. So Bongo Buddha was extremely conscious of that. And I think that was the inspiration from Gandhi that his take out is that to have a nonviolent society, to have a, uh, you know, um, uh, secular society and to have, uh, you know, uh, intercommunal harmony, it was extremely important to him. And uh, the role of India is, role of India was that India has been a special friend of Bangladesh and uh, uh, 10 million of Bengali refugees took shelter in, 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 in India. We must not forget the role of India uh, in Bangladesh's independence and uh, the joint forces to which Pakistan had surrendered. So um, today, as we speak, uh, in, a, in a few days, Prime Minister Modi will be in Bangladesh to celebrate uh, Bangladesh's 50 years of independence. And uh, the two countries are currently going through what India calls it the Sonali Odhai, which is the golden chapter uh, of our relationship. And I think uh, the, uh, every time the role of Indian army, the people of India, Srimati Indira Gandhi, uh, everything has been duly recognized by the government of Bangladesh. Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina had given this award called Friends of Liberation War. And we have recognized every single soldier that played a role 
during our war of independence, every single politician, uh, a line of politicians starting from uh, Pranab Mukherjee and Shrimanti Indira Gandhi, Sonia. So, you know, we, we have, we do recognize it each year. Even here, when we do the National Day, when we do the Victory Day of Bangladesh, we invite the Indian High Commissioner. So it's a tradition, and therefore it's very duly recognized. Coming back to 1971, Hello. Well, you know, I was about four or five years old, I think, I, at that time. And I was in Dhaka, and my father was working in the central government uh, in West Pakistan, and he was stranded there. And he was house arrested, and we uh, came to Bangladesh before the war started, and we had to flee. So my mm -hmm. home is when the 25 March genocide was happening. Uh, uh, we were with our uncle, who was a professor at the Dhaka University, uh, uh, and we saw exactly what was happening, and we had to rush to some remote village to protect ourselves. There's lots of young girls in our family. And uh, I think that's about it. That memory of uh, rushing, I don't know if you've, uh, you know, Allen Ginsberg's September Road, just saw a road in September. I don't know if you've read that, but it says exactly how every person felt who fled the atrocities. I think that would be my personal hair room. And I think that uh, an apology is owed to the women who are raped and tortured and sexually violated. That apology never came. And as a woman, I still await that. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner, Professor Subban, thank you very much. Two unexpected uh, items for the 50 Objects, 50 Years collection. I'll hand now to Noor for the final vote of thanks. Um, and I thank you for your patience. Noor. You're muted, unfortunately. Apologize. Okay. Sorry. I, okay. First of all, I do apologize that uh, we had to put this uh, event together uh, very hurriedly. We spent only just over one and a half week to get things going. So, apologies again if something didn't happen. But I think during course of organizing this event, I talked to a number of people and discussion ended up around, I am telling them that look, this lecture is going to be different from any lecture you have heard. This is going to be interesting, most interesting, informative and authoritative because it's going to come from a person who is not only been an eyewitness to the event, but he had been part in shaping it. Therefore, and I was proven quite right. So it's been really wonderful lecture. Uh, so I think everyone will join me for a warm thanks to the, uh, Professor Rahman Supan for most informative and authoritative lecture. Finally, I would like to just quickly, I know we have been online uh, for quite some time and we have Professor Rahman, uh, Rahman Subhan also have to go soon. But also I think for some strange reason, the technology has played quite a lot today. So we do apologize for this. But finally, I would like to end by thank, thank some people. Uh, so for this is fourth year part of third lecture. I think I would like to start think, thinking by uh, thanking everyone as well as for being such a wonderful uh, partner. Uh, and I know Ed and his team but does all the hard work. I always come last minute and take credit for it, most of it. Right? Uh, and especially when within his team, I would like to give a special thanks to uh, Sunil Pony because someone behind the scene, you can't see him, but he's always there. I would like this day, uh, I would also like to thank, give very special thanks to Bangladesh High Commission in general, but more specifically to the High Commissioner herself, because she has been wonderful, inspirational partner for us this year. 
and we see this is a, there are quite lots we need to do. We, so as an Seven March Foundation are committed and we'd like to see High Commission on board in for a long-term partnership to pursue some of ID. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank some of my colleagues um, at the foundation. And I think, but there are far too many, but I think a uh, special thanks goes to Ansar Ahmadullah. He is such a person does things very quietly. He's like, he's like uh, equivalent of Sunil Aswaz, right? So he, and there are obviously Farid, Ajat Bhakti, Jamal Khan, all of them deserve to be thanked. Now, on conclusion, once again, I would like to turn, go back and thank, I, I, don't, I don't have enough words to express my, our sincere gratitude to Professor Rahman Subhan for wonderful lesson. Thank you very much, Professor Subhan. Okay, Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you, everyone. Noah, thank you very much. Ed, now, 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 normally I'd be able to invite you all for a cup of tea and a samosa, but instead uh, I just have to press the end meeting button on Zoom, which is uh, an inglorious end to what's been a fascinating session. I'll just finally like to thank as well, um, Professor Soban for giving us such a, an excellent and thought-provoking talk. Uh, for all of you coming to listen to the High Commission, being here and the High Commissioner for being here all afternoon so that your time is also much appreciated. And finally, to Noor uh, and the 7th of March Foundation, likewise for being such excellent partners. I'm well aware that Professor Soban is uh, anticipating his evening meal and the sun, well, the sun is shining where I am. I hope it is in London. So I, I wish you all uh, a lovely afternoon and thank you so much for, for being here and sharing this. Uh, unique experience with us. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Thank Professor you. Rahman Subhan. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. We pray for you, your good health and long life. And we can see uh, Dr. Ronak Jahan there. Hello, madam, how are you? <laughs> Fine. We, look forward, to, we look forward to hearing you on the 25th. Right, yes. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Simpson, Seven March Foundation. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's very nice working with you in partnership. Thanks. <laughs>